So I've been in QA for 16 years. Uh, I came out of, I was at BC Rail when I started. I was in rail operations at the time. I was supervising trains and stuff. And my jump into QA was uh, <coughs> I moved down south and I needed a job and I got pulled into special projects to do some testing. At that time, they didn't do any testing that wasn't done by their users. A lot of companies start that way. They pull users in, sit them down because they're familiar with the uh, business, they're familiar with the software. Maybe if it's new software, they're going to learn it. And they essentially did acceptance testing. So I came in and did that. I, uh, I was a pretty knowledgeable uh, user at the time and a domain expert in, in lots of areas in the railway. And I sat down and um, did some testing. But I did something they never had to, done before. I wrote down my results. I wrote down the steps of how to reproduce a bug. I gave them some ideas of where to look for where the problem might be coming from. And uh, after doing that for a month, they offered me a job because they'd uh, never seen that before. And at that time, so it's not that long ago, it's only 98, 97, whatever it was, um, there wasn't a lot of QA out there. I don't know if there was any QA training, QA software, QA training at the time. Um, and from there, I worked up to uh, managing teams as big as 25, uh, teams right nine right now moving from interesting uh, company to company, all of it in software QA. Uh, it wasn't until two years ago I moved to my current company, Digital Payment Technologies, that I figured out that um, quality QA, as we uh, discuss it, there is way more out there about quality, and we don't even touch the, like, the bottom, the pinnacle of it, or the, the peak, little top of the peak of it, and we're even using our terms wrong. <coughs> A quality assurance specialist for us, not even remotely the same thing once you're out of software QA. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to try and take you through and explain how quality is looked at in the rest of the world and some other industries so that when you start interfacing with those quality professionals, you, uh, you have a little bit of background. You don't put your foot in your mouth like I did a lot of times. I'm going to talk about that too. And, uh, and you understand, and maybe you want to spread out from software QA and move into that. It's a big profession. There's a lot that you can do in it. A lot of it's pretty interesting. Um, <coughs> so uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about on this slide, so uh, pretty much every image that I uh, have tonight was stolen from the internet, so uh, don't try and go and use them. But uh, <laughs> uh, these are examples of uh, quality control. This is doing testing on pieces. This, this here is them showing that this has some fractures in it. That one's quality in some sort of financial place. And I just tried to put up some graphics that you might like. So uh, how many people in the room have uh, formal training in QA? Three, four, not too many. Um, did you take the formal training before you started or did you take it as you went after you started in QA? Yeah, um, that in my experience is pretty much how QA goes. <laughs> People don't go out and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to be QA, I'm going to start it. People I hire, I don't know that I've ever hired someone who uh, went to school, learned QA and looked for a job. And that, that's not because I have a thing against it, it's just not the peop way people do. So as I was putting this uh, presentation together, I gave some thought to what's the best training to be a QA. And I decided that the best training to be a QA was my training. <laughs> you, you, can, you can disagree if you like, but I'm going to explain it. <laughs> I'm going to explain it. So uh, when I went to university long, long ago, um, I started out taking metallurgical engineering. So the first thing you say, what the hell's that got to do with QA, metallurgical engineering? And uh, there are three things that came out of that that I think uh, have helped me be a, a much better QA. One is you're in engineering, uh, metallurgy, you're going to learn the scientific method fully applicable. The scientific method, you don't, you don't trust anything until you test it, you follow your steps, you, you put that together. That makes sense. Um, metallurgical, <laughs> metallurgical engineering has uh, loads of testing in it. Um, not software testing so much, but we had to test the hardness of metals and use the electron microscopes and do all sorts of material testing. So I did testing. And the third one in engineering is stupid deadlines that you don't have enough time for that all of it's loaded up at the end. Hello, that's QA. Um, they didn't shorten the deadlines like they often do in software, but, but that. So that's the first half of my training. Three quarters of the way through that degree, I said, this sucks. And I don't ever want to be an engineer. And uh, I went into philosophy. Obvious transition, metallurgy to philosophy. Philosophy is the other half of the training that makes you perfect to be a QA. One, they teach you critical thought. It's important in QA. Two, and this is the important one, they teach you how to argue. 
<laughs> they teach you how to win arguments against developers. So that's not a bug. And you're like, that is a bug. And then you, but it, it's, it's hard to win these arguments against some people. But anyway, so that's why I decided that anyone who wants to be a QI, what I'm going to tell them is go take three quarters of a degree of metallurgy and then do a degree in philosophy and then go out and have your career. And you can take that, you can tell anyone that. I'm not even going to uh, copyright it or anything, but that, that's sort of a side. So we're going to move into the presentation now. Um, so what's QA for us? Um, we're all software QAs or developers or something like that. None of us are coming out of the other, yeah. Um, so what is QA for us? There's lots of terms, lots of titles. Do they all mean the same thing? A lot of people use them the same way. They all kind of similar. Like, so I, I just put up some ones here. Quality assurance, quality control, verification, validation, testing, acceptance, software engineer. There's more, there's lots more. They're used almost interchangeably. Until you get to a big company that has loads of process and loads, like a huge QA where they start after delineating them all up, you just might, you'll go to, you'll stop one company, go to the next one. They'll just pick a different name and they'll be the same thing. That's not very helpful for people who are trying to understand what's going on, figure out what the roles mean, figure out where they're going. Um, and, uh, and you can run into some conf confusion. And so my next slide, yeah, my next slide uh, has an example that I came to in the job that I've just gone to. So when I came to my, my current job, they didn't call QA QA. Even though my title was senior QA manager when I got hired, they call QA verification. Some of them. Some of them call, when they send the code over to QA, they say they're sending it to validation. And so you get these terms, and they start, then they argue. And to this day, one guy still says that it, we're verification. I'm like, but I'm the QA manager. I do QA. And he's like, no, no, it's verification. So I went out and I looked it up, <coughs> what verification and validation were. Because I had not encountered them being used regularly in my, my career to this, to the, until when I took this job. And they're similar, but they're different. And there's an importance in the difference. It's not so important to my talk tonight, but um, it just sort of highlights the differences that you can see. So what is verification? It's the question, have we built the software right? I.e., does it implement the requirements as they were written? Right? Have we built what we said we were going to build? That's a lot of what QA is. So a lot of QA is, oh, that's verification. You sit down and, OK, I got the spec. Do I meet the spec? That's pretty good. That's, that's what you ask a junior QA to do. That's what you ask an intermediate QA. And that's what a lot of senior QAs end up doing as well. Then we have validation, which they're using interchangeably. Is it, have we built the right software? <coughs> I.e., do the requirements satisfy the customer? This is a lot more difficult. This is a lot harder to ask a QA to understand. This is why when I started in QA, they were pulling people out of the field and using user acceptance testing. The reason is, <coughs> if you don't understand the customer, if you don't understand the end user, <coughs> who may or may not have been translated correctly into those requirements, can you really indicate whether those requirements satisfy the customer? You could get everything right here and still not have a happy customer. Because what the BA wrote down, what the uh, engineer understood that to be, what they built, <coughs> doesn't actually meet the business need. So does QA do both of these things? Yes. Does a more senior QA do more of this? Yes. Like that's what I expect is as you get more senior, I expect you to be better at this part, putting yourself in the shoes of the end user or the customer. That brings value. Are the, so they're both part of QA. Would I ever say QA is verification? No, it's a part of QA. <laughs> would I ever say, who would ever say that all the QAs do is requirements testing? No one's going to say that. And a lot of your acceptance testing isn't even QA. Often you still bring the customers back in and you do some acceptance testing. That's a good thing to do. It, it helps you understand before launch that the customer's going to accept it. So what is QA in software? So for me, and this is where I tell you that nothing I say tonight is fact. Well, okay, there's a few things, but, but next to nothing I say to is fact because there's no set in stone standard about QA, about the terms in QA. We have some guidelines. For me, I go to Wikipedia, I look it up. That's what a thousand QAs have agreed it is. Okay, that's what I'll go with. That's where I got the definitions for verification validation. They worked for me. So what I'm going to say tonight, it's not fact, but I figure if I teach all of you what I'm saying, that's going to bring a little more standardization towards it. And then we can move towards that. You guys all know what validation and verification is now, and I'm going to test you at the end of the, 
Uh, maybe not. But uh, <laughs> we're going to see it. So I, I built this little graphic, and I, this is the one graphic on here that I produced. So anyone who wants to use this can. Um, you probably can't read most of it. But all, all that I've done, because it's a little small, is uh, all the green, those are different types of testing. And the black is uh, testing that, uh, sorry, that a QA traditionally does in software. The black is uh, testing that's done by other people. Um, so for me, QA is the entire test process from end to end. From the start, way back there in requirements design, to the push. This last one here says push testing. Um, that's what QA is. You're, you can say, you can validly say, I'm in QA if you're doing the testing anywhere in that line. If you're the requirements tester, the white box tester, the resolution tester, the integration systems tester, any of those things. The, the couple of things that are testing that are kind of mostly removed from QA but can still be done by QA is I got unit testing, which is almost entirely done by de developers, uh, or you're uh, building your continuous integration. That can be done by QAs, but you generally need a little more coding capability than most QAs have, so it's usually done by devs. And then I, I left acceptance testing black because there is that mixture between, uh, between QA and business doing acceptance testing. So again, this is in fact, I just put it up there to show you the, uh, the spread, and I liked it. Um, so uh, quality assurance, QA, it's really only just a small part of the quality profession. So, what is the quality profession, you might ask? Yeah. Push testing. Ah, push testing. So, a push test, uh, often used in web deployment, push test is when you test the product after it's launched. Right? So, when you're uh, deploying a website, deploying a mobile app, you get it out there, <clears throat> then you run through a smoke test or a deeper smoke test to determine that your push or your deployment worked. The reason we don't call it deployment testing is when we use deployment testing, which is right here, that's testing that the steps of your deployment will work properly, right? So you go to a, a clean installation, you do your deployment testing, you make sure everything gets out there, everything's good, so that when you do push or release, um, I've heard it called release testing as well, um, but my last uh, place we uh, had 16 websites and we pushed about every week and we uh, pushed in the middle of the night and then we did a push test. Um, it's best if you can automate your push testing because then you can go to sleep. <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know if you go to uh, Wikipedia if it actually says push testing, but still that's what we call it. Same thing for uh, resolution testing, another little aside. Resolution testing is a term me and my team made up about five years ago. The reason we made up that term is because people, we were a little irate that people used the term regression testing wrong. People would say, I'm going to regress these bugs. Well, you can't regress a bug. That would be saying that the bug is still working as a bug, <laughs> right? Regression testing, and you guys can disagree or correct me if you don't like, agree with my definition, but regression testing is making sure the pieces of a system that have not changed still work the same as they did before the other pieces changed. Right? That's regression testing. So someone, someone gives you back some bugs that they've resolved, and you say, I'm going to regress these bugs, which is a very common way of saying it. It just got on my nerves, because it's not uh, a very f useful term that way. So we thought about it. We, we, as a team, we were like, OK, we need a term for this. And we threw it around for a little while and came up with a bunch of things. And we decided that uh, resolution testing made the most sense. It's resolved bugs. We're testing them. It's resolution testing. And uh, every job I've had since then, I teach people that. And that's my way of you know, spreading it out. Put it up on Wik Wikipedia, but they threw it down because it didn't have enough, uh, what do you call it, so other people saying it was right. <laughs> um, but uh, a slightly silly story that goes along with that is we decided that uh, as we were looking up terms, so all of my guys were also, I think it was all guys that time, we were all, uh, we were all trained the same way. You know, We discovered QA and we started testing and learn stuff online when we learn terms or learn them from the other guys. So we were looking on the web to find different names of testing to see if we had a better name for regression testing out there. And there was not that we could find. But what we did find is that there existed gorilla testing, which we'd never heard of before. And there was monkey testing, which I don't think only one guy on the, the team had heard before and I hadn't heard it before. We're like, so we came up with resolution testing. We're like, you know what? It needs a monkey name. <laughs> All these other ones have monkey names. So we came up with babooning. It's baboon testing and resolution testing are synonymous. 
And uh, my guys still say, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing today? They're like, I'm babooning, which means they're just uh, going through bugs and closing them. So which is meetup, if you put on Wikipedia, they have a lot of people. Yeah, we'll have a lot of people who can cite it. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> um, all right, so back to the... Back to the theme. So quality profession. So um, the quest for quality is everywhere. I've listed a few things here. Um, health inspectors, they're going out, they're looking for quality. Track fault detectors, I put that up there because I worked with those. Materials testers, food safety testers, pool testers, auditors, all of them are out there with jobs in quality. They're all trying to make sure that we achieve quality. That's the same thing that every one of you, because I'm assuming you're LQA, every one of you do is spending every day doing. You're making sure that you have quality. Which, you know, kind of fits that term quality assurance. But uh, we're going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, there's all sorts of post-secondary education for quality. There are some degrees um, that uh, I tried to find some schools that have them. But uh, oddly enough, you put quality into Google and you get just a million things. But there are some degrees, degrees you can take. But most of it is sort of certifications. Um, you can take it in quality management systems, ISO auditors, workshops. You can do a whole bunch of things. And there's some industries out there that they take quality extremely seriously. Uh, my example that I used and my next slide I'm going to talk about is aviation. Um, anyone here ever worked with Aero Info? Yeah, <laughs> yeah as a client. Uh, so Aero Info is a subsidiary. I think they're a subsidiary of Boeing. Boeing yeah. yeah. They're in Richmond. Um, I've got one guy who worked there. I did an interview with them once. They're pretty big. They have a big QA department and they are very serious about quality. They do software that does, helps with the maintenance program of airplanes. So it tells you that this wing needs to have these bolts tightened every, you know, 6,000 miles or whatever. Um, they spend three months testing the requirements on paper. I made up that time. I don't know what it is. But they, they spend this three months testing the requirements on paper before they write the code. QA is testing the requirements on paper before they write the code. I think that's awesome. I think it takes a really long time, and most of the software we produce doesn't need that level of quality. But that's how serious these industries take their quality. If you go to Air and Info, they do have lots of layers of QA. They do have lots of titles. And they all do different things. And uh, when you talk to the people who come out of it, some of them really like it. Um, most of the people who work in traditional K, QA, not as much, because you do the same thing a lot. It's very rigorous. And uh, eventually, as you move more senior in QA, people don't like doing those tiny little test cases over and over and over and over and over again. You need to automate it. You need to, to make sure that you're not doing that. But so um, I went out and I looked, and I found this Quality Assurance Fundamentals Workshop. And these are the five things that that workshop was going to give you. And this, and this is why I uh, put my notes on here, the CCCA is the Canadian Council for Aviation and Aerospace. Um, this is one of the courses they give. Everyone who's doing something or other with planes has to do this. And I wrote these up here to give us an understanding of, of what a course that you take on quality. And this is a fundamental course that everyone has to take. It's not the higher level courses. The first goal that they have is understanding various management systems and risk management techniques. Risk management and QA are like this. We don't talk about it as much in software QA. But when you do a risk analysis, when you do a risk anything, you're doing, whenever you do any QA, you're helping with risk management. If you put software out that hasn't had QA, increased risk. When you QA it, decreased risk. It's risk management. Um, they teach you how to create and interpret policy documents. That's another thing about quality. Documents everywhere. ISO 9000, it's a quality spec. There's hundreds of documents you need to do. Thankfully, I've never worked at a place that's ISO 9000. Uh, developing effective documenting procedures. They have a course just to teach you how to write things down, which is good, probably. We give little tiny seminars to developers and uh, product managers about at my, this company and my last company about how to write a JIRA case, or it was fog bugs at the last company, because they write really crappy cases. <laughs> when QA gets it, like, I don't know how to reproduce this. It's one line. What the hell? How did you fix it? How do you even know? Right? They teach you these things. Understanding safety management specific requirements, audits, and quality assurance procedures. I really don't think I'd want to take this course. Uh, upon completion of this course, participants will have a sound understanding of the fundamentals of quality and its relationship to risk management. They take it seriously. Sorry, shouldn't swear. They take this stuff seriously. 
it's important to them. This is people's entire career. This is the safety of people not falling off of air, uh, out of airplanes, or airplanes not falling out of the sky. We're lucky in, in software. Software is a lot more fault tolerant until you start talking about the airplane software. But if you're releasing stuff to the web, if you're releasing stuff to mobile, and a bug gets out, sure, you got to fix it. But you know, like 50% of the bugs that get out, put, put on a backlog and you do it in the next release or the release after, whenever it becomes a higher priority. Yeah? So it's not only, I think, aviation, I think medical. Oh, absolutely. So Quality in medical is a huge, huge profession. Yeah. So yeah, the, about a third of the courses you can take in quality are for medical. Yeah. And uh, the quality assurance role, well, maybe we'll talk about that in a second. Remind me if I don't talk about it. The quality assurance role in medical, immense. But until we actually talk about what quality assurance means, it won't mean anything. <laughs> All right, so uh, because I currently work in manufacturing, I decided to just sort of uh, uh, walk you through the life cycle of quality <laughs> in manufacturing. Um, so. The last gig I had, we built uh, photo websites. The gig before that, we built, built uh, <coughs> these kiosks that let you put music onto a CD. The gig before that was the railway, and we did uh, all sorts of software to run uh, uh, trains and stuff. And oddly enough, quality was important, but it wasn't nearly as strenuous as you think it would have been. <laughs> but um, once I moved to manufacturing, when I, this is the first job I've had that actually has a manufacturing line. Um, it's just like half a block from our plant and quality um, is everywhere. It's, it's, there's, there's many hats in manufacturing. There's many phases in getting a product to the manufacturing floor. So what I'm going to talk about is taking a product from an idea to being produced in these odd levitating boxes. I, I want that machine that makes boxes levitate. Um, and the quality that's in these all the way from the first step where you're designing them. Because we do that and I've been learning that. So the, the four areas we're going to look at here is design slash engineering, implementation, production, and then where does quality assurance fit into that. So uh, I like my little guy here, but that guy looks busier. So design. What, uh, I'm not going to go through everything that what design is. This is how quality fits into design though. So we're designing the product. We're, we're coming up with a new product that's going to go out. The first thing the engineers do is they have design reviews. When it's still on paper, they're on the whiteboards, they're doing design reviews about the design itself. They're looking at the quality of just the design process that they're going to put together. Then they do computer prototyping. Just yesterday, uh, or just this morning, we were talking about there what we have, uh, so we do parking pay stations, we have coin drop shoots, and they were getting jams. Then the uh, first things they were doing is they were in SolidWorks and they were modeling it, and they were modeling coins dropping through the coin shoots and said, with this one, it drops. With this one that has a millimeter less tolerance, it jams 57% of the time. And then they tested that and, well, they got similar numbers, not exactly the same. But uh, so we do computer prototyping before you ever build anything because in manufacturing, when you go to a prototype and you need metal work and you need to get it back, um, it takes three to six weeks minimum, right, each cycle. So you spend all your money, you spend a lot of money back at design reviews and computer prototyping and making sure that that's a high quality before you go to your first prototypes. But then, once you have prototype, and you're also doing materials testing to make sure that you're the stuff that I did when I was in metallurgy, materials testing to make sure you're picking the right material that the stresses and the strains will work. Then you do physical prototyping. That's, that's the first time you have some real costs in the, uh, in the pool, because you're going to get this stuff back, and then you're going to do testing on that. You do materials testing again. You do electrical mechanical testing. You do all sorts of measuring. Once you go through that step, and most of this stuff, most of this stuff is done by the engineers themselves. It's not really done by quality assurance people, um, because they're the ones who understand the design. It's really important, and we're still a little bit early. We're still on the uh, prototypes. When you say this electro and mechanical testing, are you using some Physical devices or... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in materials testing, you're using, you're using all sorts of different test equipment. But uh, my hardware tester at work, he uses an oscilloscope, he uses a multimeter, he uses... Uh, hammer. <laughs> uh, the mechanical engineers use hammers. They absolutely do. Um, we have... Uh, there's there's a, a break-in test that we do for our, uh, our cabinets, for our parking pay stations. And there's a uh, uh, standard out there, and I forget what it's called. But the standard is for how long it takes to break into it with nothing bigger than a claw hammer. <laughs> so they take that. And one of the first things I did when I came in was convince them that writing down what they were going to do this time <laughs> meant, it, meant it would be better next time. 
because they would just go at it with a hammer and say, oh yeah, it took like 38 seconds. It's like, okay, so you fix that. Well, I think once it did take 38 seconds. But you fix that, how do you know if your next time is a good comparison, right? So uh, that's helped. And uh, we'll talk about that too in a minute because that's kind of quality assurance in the, in the good part. Um, and then we have first articles. First articles is when you, you say your prototypes are good. And so when you have a prototype made, that's usually made in a workshop off to the side of some other production facility. And they're just doing it, they're putting it together like you would in your basement, but they got better tools. First articles, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, so are you guys using 3D printers at all? Um, a couple of the people who provide our prototypes and stuff absolutely are. So we work with, first, with 3D prints uh, as some of our prototyping, yeah. But we don't, we have not bought one for ourselves yet. The engineers keep asking for one. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're super awesome. <laughs> um, not, not as much for, you, like you can't produce the electronics and stuff, but what you can do is it really helps with uh, visual design. So we were, when we were mocking up our first pay station when I was there, it was cardboard. Right, it was cardboard, looked, like, oh yeah, that looks okay. The next one we did came off a 3D printer and you're like, Oh, that's what it's going to look like. Like you knew, like right away, because it looked exactly like it's going to come out. So that's pretty awesome. We love 3D uh, printers. Um, so first articles are the first items that go through go through their production process. So in the same way that I'm going to have a production process that's going to produce an item, and you're going to have to test it, etc. When I have a component that someone else builds that's got to go into my thing. They also have a production process, which means that has to have a certain level of quality. And you're having all of these quality discussions with them and what they can sign off for and what I still have to test and so on. So the first articles are the first step of that. Within that, we then do integration testing, fit testing, mechanical testing, tolerance measuring, and QA starts having more interaction at this point. Uh, software QA has more interaction this type. So we do embedded software that lives on the controllers that we have built for us, that we design and have built for us. And when we get the first articles on a new controller, that's when we start looking at the embedded code and make sure it's running properly on these things. The engineers, the electrical engineers, they're doing measurements and making sure that there's not the wrong spikes in the wrong places and there's not noise in the wrong place. And my hardware tester helps with that. But as, at this point, we start doing some software integration testing. So that's design. Design's fun. It's new stuff. It's always new stuff. But then we have implementation. Uh, so implementation in my use here is manufacturing, the manufacturing people, the process, the plant, figuring out how they're going to take the product that the last step has designed and put it onto the floor and produce it. So it's not them producing it yet. It's them saying, I have to build a process that can produce that which you want to build. So for us, that's pretty easy so far because we're always revving changing the things that we already have and making them change a little bit. And, but you've got to document that, and so you have to build your workflows and process. If it's a new product, you have to build those workflows and process and build sample ones on your floor and make sure that that process is going to work. And uh, it's not as simple as just saying, well, I'm just going to put it together. It's making sure that your little cup filled with nuts is the right distance from the guy who's going to build it. Now, you're like, oh, yeah, whatever. But if it's too far away, you're adding a two seconds or whatever into each one of the builds that he's going to do. If it's too close, he might be knocking on the floor, and then you're missing two minutes while he's picking them all up and putting them back in the cup so he can use them. Or it's something that might break when he drops it or whatever. So these uh, workflows and process, they're important. Um, it's also a place where you can uh, test your internal, your floor, and your external supply chain. So what that means is, I got my little cup of nuts. When I run out of those nuts, how do I get more? Right? So you've got to plan for that guy who all he does is drives around that cart all day making sure that you have nuts. Like maybe you've got a giant drum of nuts, but that's all part of your planning. But then there's also the thing, what about the guy who's driving around the nuts? What happens when he runs out of nuts in the back room? That's your supply chain. You've got to make sure that you have a process that will get you these things. Quality is right there making sure that you don't run out. You don't want to stop production. That really sucks. Lots of people get angry when you stop production. It's the biggest word. When someone from manufacturing comes to me and says, we have a problem, the first thing I say is, production stopped. Because that's the same thing as if you run websites and you say it's down. Right? The same thing, only it's kind of worse because you can't make any money when production is stopped. And the, uh, the delays build and build and build and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. When you bring your website back up, you're back up. Production has to, it grinds to a halt 
and then it slowly comes back up again. And, and you can have weeks of delays, and it's horrible. Um, you have to do safety assessments in the same way as that, so you're not dropping the little cup of nuts on your foot and slipping and stuff. You have to make sure that everything is um, safe. And then one, a really big one is incoming inspections. So everything that, when you're in manufacturing, any product that you bring in that's going to be a part of what you build, whether you're building it or whatever. So we order these coin chutes, piece of metal this long, got a whole bunch of bends and swivels and stuff in it. Someone else is making that. We get that. We put that into our pay station as we assemble it with all the other stuff that we put together. When we get a box of those from the per person who's producing it, we have to have a plan for what kind of incoming, in, incoming inspection we're going to do. And you do this for every single article that's coming into your plant. You're not necessarily testing every single article coming into your plant because you build quality relationships with your vendors. So my little cup of nuts, that's a good example of where you have a quality relationship with a vendor. They produce the same thing 99.999% of the time and it does, doesn't matter. And it costs only a little bit, so you get a bow and you throw it away, you're fine. But with that coin shoot, an item that costs, I don't think it's $65 or something like that, that coin shoot that you produce is big, expensive to ship, takes a long time. I think it has a uh, six week lead time, which means a lead time, for those of you who don't know, is when you order it today, you say, I want it, here's my money. It takes six weeks before they can say, here you go. Right, because they have to build it. They have to source the supplies, they have to put it into their, their schedule and they have to get it to you. We have some lead times for some weird magnets that are 22 weeks. You can't, it takes 22 weeks after the moment you order it before you can get one in your hand. Um, so these incoming inspections, they're a big thing in QA and you have to do them right. You can decide, okay, the cup of nuts, that's fine. We don't have to do incoming inspections. But for that coin shoot, you have to say, okay, am I going to measure a sample set? Okay. Of that sample set, when I pull them, what am I going to measure? Um, and you have to make that determination. You have to build a plan and you have to figure that out. Then we go to production. So production is one, we've gone through all the designing, we've gone through all the testing, we've gone through all the prototyping, everything's okay, we know how to build it, now we're gonna turn the giant machine on because we're selling them now. So where does quality fall in the production? Well, if when you go into production, you have to have a steady day-to-day -day level of quality. That's essential. Um, in manufacturing, if you can't produce the same product time after time after time, people won't buy it. People don't want it because it's crap. Well, okay, lots of people buy crap. But that's what your goal is, to produce that quality. And you, when you're selling it to someone else, if you're not attaining that level of quality, they're not going to take it from you. And it's sort of the same way as me saying, if they don't produce that quality coin shoot for me, we're not going to buy it from them anymore. We're going to go somewhere else. You have to be able to do that time after time after time. So some of the ways that they do that, um, or the big way that you do that, is quality control. Quality control owns day-to-day -day quality. Is everyone familiar with the term quality control? Anyone familiar with the term quality control? Okay, I see some nods. Um, ever, anyone ever bought a product and you open the product and often it's an underwear and you get this little tag that falls out. It says inspected by number 34. That's quality control. That's a person on that line who's responsible for testing stuff coming off that line and making sure that that product is good. Most of the time your incoming inspections are also done by quality control. It's often called QC. They're the people who test if everything is working. Um, so uh, they test samples in the line, they test samples at the end of the line. I mean, this is finally where I'm gonna bring in um, quality assurance. Actually, I guess that's the next slide. So quality, this is the transition, ah, look at that. Quality assurance helps determine what level of testing needs to be done and how. They help quality control understand what they have to do, what they have to test to help ensure the level of quality that you want to get through. So, this is like the big finish line, there's like three more slides. Quality assurance, what the hell is quality assurance? Um, why are we here talking about it? So, a quality assurance professional, outside of software, we're not talking about software, rarely performs day-to-day -day testing, whereas a software QA rarely doesn't perform day-to-day -day testing. That's a big difference. Quality assurance outside of QA, and that's, if I say QA, it means with software, now, does not mean testing. Quality assurance people don't do testing in the way we're thinking about testing. A QA professional centers their life around process. They want work done efficiently, safely, repeatedly, constantly with high quality. Ooh, typo. They assess, analyze, organize, and manipulate data until they see what can be improved. 
So when we're talking about incoming inspections, it's a quality assurance person who's helping determine how much you need to inspect, what the process you're going to do to inspect it is. They're the ones who are helping uh, produce the manufacturing flow on the floor. They're, they're, it's probably an ME, a manufacturing engineer, who's saying, we're going to do it this way. And they might even start doing it this way. But then it's a quality assurance professional who's coming in and saying, OK, you know what? Really, if we move those cups over here, then you're going to stop getting this torsion thing in the arm. And he's going to do it a second and a half faster. And you're going to build 1,022 extra units a year, which is money in your pocket. Um, a quality assurance uh, person tells, helps a QC, a quality control person, understand what they need to test. And when you start seeing more defects than you should have, they start finding out where the problems are in the process. Quality assurance is all about process in the bigger quality world. QC is about testing for quality. QA is about finding ways to improve quality through your process. Um, we transition here into QA professionals are trained with very, a, lot, a whole bunch of tools. And I just got a sort of a sampling here so you understand um, how many there are. So uh, people, a lot of people, have, have you heard of Six Sigma? So that's, that's mostly in manufacturing. It's not so useful in just software. There's some, th there's some tools you can take out of it, but Six Sigma. Lean, lean is a type of uh, uh, process for manufacturing, which essentially is you run a lean process, which means you buy things so they get there just in time to build them, and you're moving stuff through in just in time, so you don't hold a lot of overhead and things move really fast. Lean is really good. APQP, plan, do, act, check. That's what that little diagram there is. TQM, which is total quality management. So they use all these tools. These tools are filled with um, statistical measurement devices, um, like a Pareto and a fish diagram and all these things that help you analyze, again, your process, trying to figure out where the problems in the process are. So that it helps you narrow down so where you can look for the actual actions that are causing the problems. Um, there's many quality standards that uh, quality assurance people are, uh, help organizations adhere to, such as ISO 9000, BSI, which is the British one, and IEC, which is the European one, and there's a whole bunch of others. There's many quality organizations. I don't know of a lot of just software organizations for quality. But ASQ is a big one I joined when I turned this company. I'd never heard of it before before I joined this company. It's the American Society of Quality. It's cool. <laughs> um, it's where I started learning about all this other quality stuff, but they have a big area for software. They're, they have a lot of training, a lot of information for software. So I like them. There's EOQ, that's the European one. There's SQA, which is uh, software quality. I guess there's a soft one. Software quality, um, I wrote it over there. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's a whole bunch of certifications you can take. The MQOE, the black belt, the green belt, both of these relate to Six Sigma. Um, all of these things are for quality professionals. Most of these things don't really help software quality people. Um, so, uh, what do you do with the CMMI? Uh, uh, <coughs> model integration? I don't ignore it. We use it at where I am. Yeah, this was written late at night, and it's just a bunch of examples. Oh. <laughs> so you're right. That's one. We like that yeah. one. <laughs> Directly software yeah. model and yeah. it can be used in software organization. It can. It's also used outside of software. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So what is QA in software, as in quality assurance? What is QA in software? So does your average software QA actually do QA? Um, my answer is no. Not really, not, not your average guy. He's not really doing quality assurance as I've discussed today. Mostly, I think, they're doing a QC hybrid. I call it a hybrid because whereas that guy on the line is testing each one as it comes through and each one is the same and you're producing it all, um, software, you're testing the whole product and then you release it. And then you're testing a whole new product and then you release it. So it's not one to one. But I think that mostly what your juniors and intermediates and a lot of your a lot of your seniors, what they're doing is quality control more than they're doing quality assurance. I'm not saying we should change the terminology. I just want to understand how it relates to what they're doing out there in the, in the I would say the real world, but our world is real. Um, <clears throat> they determine if the product is of sufficient quality to be released, same as a QC does. They share the same skills that, that a manufacturing QC has. They have the eye for detail. They, they uh, are looking for flaws. They're looking for ways that the flaws come about. 
So where does QA belong inside of QA? A good QA always watches for reoccurring bugs, bad areas of code, particular, particular practices resulting in errors, and tries to figure out ways to change process to make things work better. These type of QA really annoy developers. They're the ones who say to developers, you know, if you wrote your code a little differently, or you know, if we wrote requ requirements for this code a little differently, um, there's a resistance to this from developers. But this is the type of skill that I watch for as I'm going to promote a QA into a senior title. Because realistically for me, as you move from a junior to an intermediate, you're building, you're honing your skills as a good QC. You're, you're able to do that. You're able to do it repeatedly. You're starting to do t planning for it. But as soon as you start building test plans, as, start as you start looking at the process as a whole and why every time they release a new version of the code, you have a bug on this one particular area, you realize that there's process problems here. And then often, you raise your voice and you get shouted down. But sometimes they listen. And when they listen and they fix it, things get a little bit better. They probably broke something else, but things get a little bit better. And for me, that's what quality assurance is. Quality assurance is being the guy who's watching for the process. And I like to this picture here because another, uh, another way of uh, making QA into words for me is a quality advocate. A lot of quality assurance people out there at a company, they might even have the title of quality advocate. And so this guy preaching to all the other guys about what to do with quality, what to make things better. Um, this is really hard to be this guy. It's really hard. Um, often they're hated, <laughs> reviled. Um, often in, uh, so when you read case studies, so I, I was thinking about doing a certification. I was reading these case studies in quality outside, in quality management. And uh, often a place will say, we need quality. They hire a quality assurance guy. Doesn't really get support from above because they just wanted to have a quality guy. Certainly doesn't get res uh, uh, support from below because quality assurance almost always means change. People hate change, which means that you're the quality advocate and you're a target and they hate you and they come after you. But that doesn't mean it's not important. And it's the same thing. If you're that one guy on your QA team who always says, if you did things better, we could get things done better, um, they might hate you, but sometimes they might listen. And if they listen, things will be better. And they won't just be better for you, they'll be better for the customer, better for the company. And, you know, maybe not better for the dev, but eh. they're not as important as the customer and the company. Uh, yeah? I have just a comment about QA that we were talking about in mm -hmm. the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, to me, like, it's not only to find out the problems with the development uh, of the product. Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, it's the same thing that, uh, that take care of about the testing even. Like if the testers are doing the good job or right job. And, uh, oh, absolutely. That's, that's how I spend most of my day is yeah. making sure that my team yeah. is testing for the right things, right? Yeah, exactly. if, if bugs are making it through, yeah. that means the quality of my team's process is not high. Right? And you're absolutely right. As a quality assurance manager, yeah. that's one of my primary needs. And that's a good thing. I should have had that in my slides. That's, that's a good thing for me to think about is making sure that the process itself of QA is appropriate, it's catching the bugs that you want to have. The first thing I ever do when I go into a new place is make sure before we do a test plan, we're doing a risk assessment. So in our test plan, it tells us where to spend the time that's gonna catch the bugs that are important, right? So absolutely, absolutely. That's, and as you get more senior, you're thinking more about that. You're thinking about how you're gonna test things, and then you go, you go meta, you go to the next level about it. How am I always going to test things? So every time I write a test plan, I'm going to capture that. Or how should I write my test plan? So every time I'm making sure I'm doing this, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. So what lessons have I learned? Um, I've learned that working at a company with manufacturing software, that there's no real difference when it comes down to it. It's all about focusing on quality. It's a bunch of words, a bunch of ways of thinking about it. But as long as you're thinking about quality, you're still thinking the right way. Um, I got into a, a whole bunch of agreements when I started with a, uh, uh, at the company RF with a uh, friendly agreement, disagreements, with uh, the hardware engineering manager who also was in charge. He was in charge of quality at manufacturing when I started. And I started saying, yeah, I'm in QA. And he's like, you're not in QA. I'm like, yeah, I'm like the senior manager of QA. Look, I got a biscuit. He says, no, no, that's not QA at all. And we had these arguments until, and I was really adamant. It's like, 
I've been doing this for 15 years, because it's two years ago. I've been doing this for 15 years. I know what software QA is. And then I started reading all these books and stuff. I'm like, damn it if he wasn't right. But he's not right too, right? Because we've, we've carved out our own profession. We've used the terms on our own. You, I'm not saying you guys should walk away from here today and when people say, hey, are you in QA? You say, no, I'm in QC. Don't say that. You're in software QA. You are a QA, you're in software QA. What I'm trying to do is just present to you the, uh, the viewpoint so you can talk to someone who's in quality profession otherwise, that you understand what quality assurance is for them. You understand what it is to really use quality assurance within software QA. And then you just have a broader perspective of, of where things are. Um, so the only way to achieve consistent quality is to build a process that enables consistent quality. Seems really simple. But lots of people don't do it. It's like a lot of people, a lot, and this is a lesson that they kept learning and Six Sigma teaches you and Lean teaches you and all APQP teaches you, is that it doesn't matter. You can't test every piece, everything, and just take out the ones that are broken because they might all be broken if your process is bad. You have to get a good enough process to get a good enough product. But there's trade-offs. Uh, so this is the best one of the triangles that I've ever seen on a, on a dice there. You have the triangle, money, time, quality. You can only have two of them. Then the other one slips. So if you want to spend only a little money and take only a little time, quality suffers. If you want really, really, really high quality and you're willing to spend as much, uh, and you're willing to take the time to do it, then you don't have to spend a lot of money. But if you don't want to spend a lot of money, then it takes a lot of time. Right? So I really like that. Um, so you can't release software without testing it, but you can't get better, reduced time, cost, budget without improving your process. Oh yeah, we're done. Uh, any questions, comments, complaints? <laughs> yeah. Um, if I understood well, uh, do you mean that the quality assurance, I mean the real quality insurance introduces, yeah. are one of the things that uh, the project management office is supposed to do? Um, <coughs> so. If we think about, so yes and no. If, I think, if you think about software, developing software, the, uh, more often than not, the area that defines and makes sure that your process, your project process, is a good one, is the PMO. That is part of what their mandate is um, in, in most software that I've seen. Um, they, however, while they're, they're defining the project um, process of how things move and go, they're not they don't have their hands in the development process, no. right? <laughs> they, don't, they don't tell coders how to code. That's left to the development managers to do that, right? Um, and for the most part, QA leaves that to development managers too. But what QA can do is when they see something recurring, something bad in that process, the development process, they can bring it up and say, hey, it's a little bit, maybe if you tried this, see if that would do it better, right? So yes, the PMO for that. When you move out into what I've just called the real world, because we all live in a fantasy world, so I guess. The good practice of the project? Uh, yes, that's with the PMO. When you step outside and you look at the project, you look at a project manager for a uh, non-software project, they're not responsible for the process of it getting built at all. They're responsible for making sure that all the materials for that project happen. They make sure that all the resources that can put those things together happen. But it's, it's, and it could be them. If you don't have any quality assurance people at all, it could, sure, it could be them. It could be anyone else. It could be the lead engineer. It could be the manufacturing engineer. Like it could be everyone, uh, lots of things you read, lots of the, you got signs on the board and plants. It's like everyone is responsible for quality and they got those things, right? But I've not seen it where that project manager outside of software is responsible for process so much beyond just the process of the project moving forward. But again, nothing I say is necessarily fact. <laughs> yeah. For the manufacturing industry, there are certain standards for the production and quality assurance, like uh, ISO and B Bureau yeah. Veritas. Yeah. So, is there any standard for software industry, like uh, for the manufacturing, we can blindly we are following the standards? I'm going to uh, express um, lack of complete knowledge. Um, I think there are standards. There are standards that people adhi adhere to. Every measure I've seen of those standards is not a great one. Um, so think about it this way. When, when you uh, categorize a bunch of bugs, right, and you give them priority and you give them severity and stuff, it's all subjective. And if you put a standard around how much of that bugs you're going to release and et cetera, um, although the 
the capability matrix. And dual 178. Maybe there's not a So yes, but I don't know it. That's what I said, right? <laughs> but if, if you think about most of the standards that we see, that people who aren't taking the training are working in aviation, they're not really widely adhered to, and they're hard to measure, and they're subjective. So yes, there are standards. I'm not an expert on them. I can provide one perspective. Um, I come from the medical, the software as a medical device field, and um, we have uh, quality system standards that we need to adhere to. Our biggest market is the U.S., so FDA regulations are what govern a lot of our activities. ISO 13485 is the uh, quality system standard, um, and then we also have IEC 62304, which is for uh, developing medical device software. Um, so those are the ones that we have to adhere to, and um, and we actually get audited against on a regular basis. Yeah. So these are limited to only medical devices, right? Yeah, I mean, thir yeah, it, it, they're specific to medical devices. Now, 13485, which is defining a quality system, is actually taking the ISO 9000 standard and modifying it so that it's pertinent to the quality uh, to medical devices, given regulatory expectations in different jurisdictions. So the uh, skill sets of your team, do they, like, 100% you uh, have the com compliance uh, with those certifications, or? Well, I really found this, this talk interesting because you're coming at it from a different angle. Um, and uh, we've got, just, just to lay a baseline here, we call our, our, our traditional software, what you would call your software QA, they're our QC group. And they, they identify as QC. Whoo! I was right! I was right! <laughs> and and it's, it's very explicit, they are performing verification. We've got a separate group, product engineers, that are performing validation. And if you just think of your classic V model, that's exactly the, the level of specifications that they're, uh, that they're testing against. Um, essentially, we hold true to that. And uh, the group that I manage um, is some software quality assurance analysts, and just like you said, uh, very process oriented. We actually audit the projects against their process, against the established process, and the tailoring that's that's represented in the in the project plans. And this also gets to your question about the involvement of the PMO. Uh, we actually have our set defined methodologies, um, software development life cycles, etc. And it's up to the project team to define how they want to actually build the software, given what they're trying to accomplish with it and the technologies involved. And then where they want to actually deviate, it's not something that's done ad hoc, right? They're proactively specifying that they want to make changes from the traditional process, and they embed that in their project plans. And so when my guys go in and audit the project, they're doing it against both the process, the established process, and the tailorings that they've actually got uh, um, approval to. Um, and that's before you build it. Yeah. That's before you even think about building it, because then yeah. QC's measuring it. So again, we're back to quality assurance. You're assuring yeah. the, the quality of the process. But like you're saying too, it's usually with bigger companies, and our engineering, our engineering department is just shy of 300 people. So, um, explain for me. Uh, are we okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe explain further. So, if if I'm following your standard, your medical standard, and there's a bug in the UI, like the the interface that the user is going to use to use yeah. the software, and it doesn't impact the measurement that comes out the other end, because most medical software is about having some sort of measurement at the other end. Does that break the standard? Is that still counted in your standard as a bug that counts against it? No, or is it only when you impact the measurements and the safety of the patient? Um, it, it, it depends on, on, actually more importantly, on whether there's a safety issue involved, because we're talking medical, right? Right. So we actually start right out of the gate with a preliminary hazard analysis. You know, so that's uh, that's even when we're just scoping out the uh, the project, and based on the scope of what functionality is going to be introduced, we actually conduct a preliminary hazard analysis, and then that will tell us where our general areas are that we need to focus our attention, and then that gets actually drilled down into a product risk as assessment, and that's where we're actually identifying our risk control measures, and so if and and the risk control measure it can be as simple as uh, you know labeling on the UI. Right, warning, let, warning uh, prompts come up. True. Sort of thing. Like you could pick the wrong age, and then oh, yeah. everything could be wrong. But right. the other, the other part too is a, a risk control measure. Um, more so in North America, EU is moving away from it. Is uh, the uh, what's written in the user guide? You know, I mean, those are all those all count, right? 
um, but basically safety by design is the, uh, the root of the... People don't read user guides. No, I, well, exactly. <laughs> it's it's not a good way to protect for safety. And the EU this year has <laughs> Why'd you kill this guy? It was in the user guide. <laughs> and there's a standard for that, ISO 14971. Yeah. That's good. Thanks for thanks for speaking up. Yeah, no worries. You know, and justifying everything I said. That was great. <laughs> uh, any other questions, comments, um, complaints? <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're done. Thank you for coming. Excellent.